Hello, I'm Andre Volchek, the CEO of global cybersecurity company Avast. And I'm joined today by Nick, Dr. Nick Kamek uh, from Welcome. We'll be talking about how the technology is accelerating medical research into COVID-19 treatment and prevention. Hello, Nick. Uh, would you please tell us a bit about yourself, uh, your role at, uh, at Welcome? I understand you've only been there for about a year. Yeah. Hi, Andre. Very nice to meet you and, and to join you today for this discussion. So, yeah, I joined Welcome last October, actually to lead a large 80 million uh, pound program um, to improve uh, snake bite treatments around the world with a particular focus on sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there are over 100,000 deaths a year around the world from snake bite and half a million disabilities. And it's a massive problem that is actually solvable. So that's why I joined Welcome. My background is actually in infectious diseases, um, firstly in academia and then many uh, years in uh, pharmaceutical companies involved in the discovery and development of medicines for HIV, for hepatitis C, hepatitis B, malaria, tuberculosis. Um, so I joined Welcome, as I said, last October. And then, of course, after Christmas and in March time, COVID certainly over here in the UK hit. And I think my uh, background sort of set me up really to uh, lead this therapeutics accelerator that Welcome set up with the Gates Foundation. No, it's, it, it is truly amazing uh, the, the amount of change we went through in the last uh, six months or so, isn't it? Now, now the work that, that Welcome is doing is really interesting. And uh, in particular, the, 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 the gap between the, uh, the funding that's coming to this, uh, 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 you know, to solving of this problem uh, and uh, the public health measures uh, is, uh, I guess, you know, one of the key issues. So what do you think is the role of the private sector in, in accelerating uh, the, the, the research here? Yeah, so I, I think uh, private sector hugely important uh, in tackling COVID-19 for, for two re reasons, really. Uh, those in the private sector that have expertise in the discovery and development of medicines, that expertise is really important uh, to help in the sort of the overall uh, global efforts. Uh, but I think just as importantly, even perhaps even more importantly, uh, are uh, private organizations, private companies who see the challenge, see the problem and want maybe don't have the expertise, but want to offer support from a funding perspective to help us uh, deliver what we need to do, which is treatments and vaccines for uh, COVID-19. So that that latter group of which I've asked, of course, is one uh, hugely important uh, because it gets the world helps get the world back on its feet and, and business back to uh, to normal. I've got actually um, a question for you then, feeding off that really, is, is, is um, you know, you, you, Avast could, could have supported many different efforts in, in uh, the COVID crisis and, and what made you um, sort of focus your attention on, on uh, uh, the therapeutic accelerator? Yeah, so it, it, it is interesting. I mean, we, we you know, went to the, to the drawing board, I guess, and uh, were thinking, uh, took quite some time to think about how to best spend the money. Uh, we knew uh, there were many worthy causes to support, uh, but at the end of the day, as a tech company, we really thought uh, it is the most important thing is to uh, support the research and, and, and the core basically uh, looking at uh, fixing the, uh, the cause rather than the, the symptoms. Uh, so um, that's uh, why we decided to uh, team up with Welcome and uh, to donate uh, $12 million to the Gate uh, Therapeutics Accelerator and $8 million to CEPI. Both are in the, uh, in, in, in the area of, uh, of, you know, base research uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in that. So, uh, you know, talking about the Gates uh, Therapeutics uh, Accelerator, the, um, um, you know, what do you think are the, um, uh, you know, we, we both sit on the on the funders board there, uh, and uh, we know there is some ongoing discussion uh, about um, uh, the, the the future of that. 
So what do you think are some, some of the common challenges and why, why is the accelerator so important? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think the biggest challenge, of course, is that uh, COVID-19 is a new virus. It's not, not a new family of viruses. We've had um, experience of them, of members of this family of viruses moving from animals to humans in the last um, sort of 20 years. So SARS back in 2003, and then uh, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome in 2011-12. They're not new from a family, but COVID-19 is a different virus again from that family. So the biggest challenge is trying to understand everything about that virus, both from how it infects humans, how the immune response of humans is developed to that virus, whilst at the same time trying to make treatments and vaccines in parallel. I think ordinarily, you know, with other viruses, as I was mentioning previously, HIV or with bacteria like TB, we know an awful lot about those. Um, and that helps us in the design of our treatments and vaccines. In this case, everything's at pace. We're in July now, and it's all been happening in this first half of the year. And I, I think the biggest challenge is, again, understanding the virus, but also assimilating the massive amount of information that's coming out uh, to the benefit of the programs that we're trying to, to deliver. I think the other piece, and we touched on it previously, is this is a pandemic. This is not something, this is not like Ebola that was in Africa, and many of us could sit back and watch from a distance. This is happening everywhere. And we really do need uh, the sort of the global community who understand these diseases to come together. And that's public and private sector. Uh, there's no point, uh, as we, as it's quite obvious, but say it anyway, no point to eliminate COVID-19 in, in our countries if it's existing everywhere else. Because uh, we're in a, still in a period of very little air travel. And so as soon as that kicks back up, we will see, for example, what's been happening in Australia in this last week or so, folk flying in, reintroducing COVID-19 and, and, and a new outbreak taking off. So uh, big challenges uh, around the speed with which we develop and assimilate the information. So on that subject, uh, where, where are we really in terms of research for a cure for treatment? Yeah, so I sort of like to describe it, the three buckets. The f when this first came about, when we first uh, uh, understood about COVID-19, the quickest way for a treatment for COVID-19 is to use a medicine that already exists. Now, that's not a medicine that exists for COVID-19, but there are infectious disease medicines out there that we could test to see if they can make some difference. Some difference might be the difference between life and death because you just suppress the infection enough for the body to be able to respond appropriately or even at another level the difference might be individual doesn't need to go into hospital and we save hospital beds and that that sort of massive stress on health systems uh, and of course we're particularly focused in low middle income countries and where the infrastructure for health systems is not always as as we would like so um, the first uh, uh, sort of medicines we've been looking at are what we call repurposed medicines, these that were developed for other conditions. The advantages there are that they have been in humans, many who, uh, the safety is well known, we know how to dose them and so on. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, is they're not specific for COVID-19. And you, you, Andre, I know you've seen there's huge numbers of clinical trials of all of these repurposed medicines been going on. And, and frankly, very little coming out. Remdesivir is one drug that we've seen benefit. It's injectable. So as a potential treatment for everybody around the world, that will be a real challenge. Um, and then most recently, we saw a, an old drug, dexamethasone, um, an anti-inflammatory drug, uh, actually cause, uh, uh, have a mortality benefit. In other words, 
uh, one in eight people would not die where ordinarily uh, they would. So it's a start. It's not the uh, solution by any stretch, but it shows that some of those repurposed medicines uh, can make a difference. And we'll keep looking at those. So that's one bucket. So, sorry, based, sorry on yeah. this, but based on your experience, how, how common it is that such repurposed medicines can actually work? You have a new disease uh, that emerges somewhere. You actually find a, a, a treatment uh, that ex has existed for some time. You can just apply. Is this like a matter of luck or is there actually more to it? So that is that for a virologist like me, that is a great question, Andre, because you'd like to think that similar viruses, many of these drugs for one should work against the other one. And they don't. They don't. There's just subtle differences that mean uh, you'd think it should work, but it doesn't. There are, there are examples for, uh, in HIV and hepatitis B where the same drugs work, uh, same drugs for HIV will work, some of them will work for hepatitis B. But there are other good examples like uh, dengue um, is a very similar virus to hepatitis C. And there are many hepatitis C drugs and none of them work against dengue. So uh, it's back to your comment, which is we need a little bit of luck on this one. Yeah, so that's actually, sorry, I mean, coming from a similar uh, background as in viruses, uh, but uh, cyber viruses in our case, uh, I have to say that in the cyber realm, it is very, very similar. That is uh, sometimes treatments or fixes that we developed uh, back in the days for certain families or certain strains of viruses actually happen to work for newly emerging viruses as well, uh, but most often they just don't. So. Wow. Even more similarities than I imagine between our two antivirus worlds. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so just to continue, from the, the second um, and really quite exciting area for uh, COVID therapeutics uh, are monoclonal antibodies. So monoclonal antibodies, um, I'll tell you, you very simply, and I know you know this, but basically they are individual antibodies known to inhibit the virus, so stop it entering cells where it needs to grow. And they've been sort of scaled up into huge amounts that you can then use as treatments. So it's just like any one antibody you would make yourself if you were infected with COVID-19, taken out and grown up in a manufacturing sort of uh, scale to then be able to give to people. So you can sort of envisage uh, in this sort of treatment is fast forwarding your immune response, really helping the body get the upper hand in dealing with the, uh, the virus. So monoclonal antibodies are now being developed by large companies by academic and institution academic organizations and institutions and the sort of a race now of determining their safety which i have to say for uh, a monoclonal antibody they are actually human antibodies so in principle the safety is going to be good so that's a great thing because for many medicines the big thing you need to find out early on is whether they're safe before you can even test the efficacy. So these will be safe. And then I think it's the level of efficacy that we'll be able to see. We, we want, for around the world, we want, obviously, very potent, low dose, so that we can manufacture the quantities we need, and a strong preference for either subcutaneous or intramuscular injection, so not intravenous, which would make uh, it much more of a challenge to deliver, particularly in low middle income countries. So they, this is what we're going to see over the next months. You'll see it in all the press, all the data. Um, but again, there will be a lag between this early data and producing the amounts at scale that we need. So that's the second and the most immediate new uh, area coming through. And if I just very quickly, I think after that, um, we will see uh, what we call small molecules, so small chemicals that are really specific for this virus. It might be for the machinery that replicates the virus, that makes it grow. 
Um, we'll see those start to come through during this year and beyond, but they, there'll be a lot more safety uh, to do there because they are chemical and we don't know anything about them. Uh, but uh, the reason why I mentioned those, and that's more for the longer term, is that you know we're, we're dealing with COVID-19 now. If we find a small chemical that works against COVID-19's basic replication machinery, if COVID-25 comes along, back to an earlier question of yours, this will work, right? We know this will work because it's directed against uh, key aspects of this family of viruses. So for us, I think it's really important that we drive through to finding those types of medicines so that we don't end up in the position we're in today. Uh, so that applies only to the small molecule, to the third uh, one that you spoke about. Yeah, because the monoclonal antibodies are very specific for COVID-19, but for the protein on its surface that helps it get into cells. That changes for different viruses, even within the same family. And so if COVID-25 comes along, the monoclonal antibodies, they may do something, but, but it'll be a bit more like repurposing. Yeah, and I, I suppose when you say COVID-25, you also mean like people now speak about the potential of second wave, uh, just looking at what happened with Spanish flu 100 years ago. So if, if COVID-20 <laughs> comes uh, later this year, that, that that would be, but we don't have these treatments yet. Yeah, COVID, yeah, so for, for me, yeah, COVID-20 or 21 is the same virus resurging new waves of it. I'm so talking about, you know, in, all right, COVID-30, in 10 years' time, another coronavirus jumps into humans. Uh, I think we'll be in a much better space. It would be a real prime not to have these medicines and indeed vaccines uh, uh, ready for the world. C can you also explain to me, when we talk about treatments in general and drugs, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the target the typical patient for these treatments would be uh, like at which stage of the disease. What I mean is that uh, we have seen that the disease for many people is very mild symptoms and then you know it may get much worse all of a sudden and then people need you know to be connected to the ventilators and uh, it, it becomes all of a sudden a, a lethal disease for them. So I'm thinking is uh, the treatment something that would only be applied to people who already get to this stage or even earlier? I think, uh, again, great question. I think we really, really, really need treatments that will um, be used in either people who feel that they've got the infection, get the test, and they actually have so mild before they get to the hospital. We want to keep people out of the hospital because, as you've rightly said, you can go into hospital and go home in seven days or be on a ventilator in seven days, and we don't really know who will go in which direction. So we've got to keep people out of the hospital. So I think the focus for us for treatments are the mild patients or even where there's an outbreak, um, prophylaxis. So giving something to people, an antibody, for example, a, a quick subcutaneous antibody as we've been talking about, uh, would last for two, three, four weeks, depending on which uh, its its properties. So imagine where there's a, an outbreak in an area, you could quickly give people, it's not a vaccine, it's a treatment, but that lasts in the body for that period of time. You could quickly kill off that small outbreak by treating everybody with an antibody uh, that would last for a period of time and the virus will die out. The virus, fortunately if, for us, has to live in humans. Um, we hear all this stuff about it lives on plastic for whatever length of time. At the end of the day, to, to grow and replicate, it's got to be in humans. So if you can prevent that um, in the short term with those sort of treatments, clearly with a vaccine for a much longer term. Oh, and when, sorry, uh, when you say humans, it, it, it is really human. That is, uh, isn't it uh, any living uh, cells? Uh, is it really just human cells? Uh, so COVID-19, of course, it, it came from an animal species, still debated, um, but it must grow inside your own respiratory cells uh, to spread. Okay, interesting. Okay, didn't know that. Uh, um, can you tell me a little more about some of the other projects that uh, Welcome is supporting? Uh, 
um, in, in terms of COVID? Yeah, so we, through the Therapeutic Accelerator, actually, we've supported um, uh, clinical studies of repurposed medicines, as we were talking about earlier. Uh, one big study um, in post, uh, sorry, pre-exposure prophylaxis for healthcare workers. This is basically giving a drug to healthy health healthcare workers who are having to deal with COVID-19 patients and looking to see if it will uh, protect them because they need all the help as well as the PPE that they wear. They need all the help they can get. So that that's ongoing. An interesting study we've just um, uh, supported is actually um, going out into the community with the treatment to people's homes or to care homes and treating them there rather than bringing them into the hospitals. Because we've seen, particularly for elderly uh, folk, uh, they're better off treated at home quickly um, so that they uh, can recover in that sort of environment. So it's called the hospital at home and it involves actually expert physicians in uh, respiratory disease and they actually go to the homes. And the reason why we've supported that is it's a model that is very transferable to low middle income countries, whereas we were discussing hospital infrastructure is perhaps not everything uh, we want. So that's another example of something we've supported. And again, um, and through the Gates Foundation, uh, similar studies of other types of, of medicines, and we'll continue to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, can we talk about uh, vaccination a little bit as well? I understand there is now over 100 different uh, prototype vaccines. Uh, why do we need so many and uh, why are vaccines important uh, to begin with? Yeah, so um, at this stage in development of a vaccine, so this early testing in humans, it probably has a, uh, the numbers are debated, but a 15 to 20 percent chance of being successful. So uh, we need many vaccines in development so that one or more come through in the end as successful vaccines. And I think particularly with COVID-19, th there's also the fact that many new technologies are being tested as well. So there's an extra risk on top. So hopefully out of all of these 115 different vaccines being evaluated, we get uh, we need more than one simply because, as we've discussed, we need to reach the whole world in this pandemic and scaling different ones up in different places will be uh, useful. Um, we need a vaccine ultimately to, for this virus to die out. I think we need therapeutics as well. It's not one or the other. Uh, there are many folk, for example, immunocompromised, the very old, who frankly will not make a good immune response to a vaccine. So there'll always be a need for treatments for those people. Um, and there will always be uh, areas of the world that still haven't had the vaccination program. And therefore, if those folk are either moving around the world or interacting with um, uh, others, um, then there'll be a need for treatment there. So for, for today, while we're in a pandemic, we need both. And I think there's a lot still to be learned about how the immune response is developed. You'll, you know, we're all reading in the, the publications and in the press that the antibodies disappear very quickly. But that's that could be a normal thing and that you have another arm of the immunity preserved with a memory so that if you were infected again, you would be fine. So still lots to learn there, but I, I can't emphasize enough the need for both treatments and vaccines. And I'm sure you are getting this question all the time, but uh, in terms of timing, what do you think is realistic? So I'm not going to give you the answer you want here, Andre, but I, you know, I think for uh, treatments, if we see in the next, you know, it could be next week, next month, rest of this year, if we see one of these repurposed medicines or two together, maybe making a real difference, that could move very quickly. But before the end of this year, we could have something that is being distributed at scale around the world. Uh, if it's monoclonal antibodies, as we're discussing, an exciting an approach, I would say early next year, 
is when we'll see those really being rolled out. Um, so there'll be clinical studies during this year. And I think for vaccine as well, a rollout, a real rollout globally will happen next year, but could start as early as the end of the year uh, for some uh, parts of the world. But that's the earliest. That, that's great. Nick, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it's been really fascinating to get your insight, uh, expert knowledge on, on this subject. And thank you for everything you are doing and for, Wilcom, for, for what Wilcom is doing. Thank you. And I, I, Andre, I have to, so firstly, thoroughly enjoyed it. And I, I have to say how far-sighted of, of us to, uh, to not just get involved in therapeutics, but also vaccines. I mean, it, it really shows how you uh, see uh, the need for uh, dealing with this pandemic. And for that, those of us in the, you know, the, the business of trying to find medicines and vaccines are truly appreciative. Thank you. Thank you. Very humbling.